So as many of you know, I teach a course on uh, technology and the future of medicine. And uh, um, in that course, we talk about such things as the fact that machines are becoming exponentially smarter. Um, it's, it's not a linear change, it, it, it's a logarithmic change. So that 14 years from today, machines will be as smart as individual humans. And 30 years from today, machines will be as smart as the entire aggregate human race. That's called the technological singularity. And from that point beyond, machines will be in charge of what goes on in the world. Now, most of you are probably skeptical that this will happen. Um, but think of the reasons for that skepticism. It's not that the evidence isn't there. It's that this it would be a very you know, inconvenient thing. And for me, when people tell you about something it's not convenient, your, your initial reaction is, ah, this won't ha happen, or I'm not going to worry about this. You will all be alive when this happens. You may think you won't. You may think you're not going to live 30 years, but longevity is going to, to increase. Probably every one of you in this room will still, still be around in uh, 2045. OK, so what about kidney medicine? What I'm going to argue today, most people will lose their jobs. What, and it may not matter. We'll have some sort of subsidized income because, you know, if everybody's going to lose their job because robots can do your job better, there'll be some way in which humans will continue to, to uh, be um, maintained. So you will be ma maintained along with the rest. Machines will replace most human labor in the next 30 years. But what about nephrology? I'm going to argue today that you are one of the few groups that will still be employed in 2045. And the reason is that all of these questions about the regenerating kidney that you have completely ignored, that you don't think are relevant to think about, are so complex. And you uniquely have the background to understand them that we're still going to need human beings dealing with those issues 30 years from now. So I hope maybe that excites you a little bit. You probably thought, what's this noon going to be? Oh, that's this pathologist talking. And if you didn't like pathology, you expected that this hour would be of zero value to you. So I hope maybe it's a little bit better. There's a kind of survival. As a renal physician, you know, what's the future of your career going to be like? Or of a human being on this planet? Whichever way you, you look at it, what I'm talking about today, today is of some relevance. This curve of Moore's Law comes from price performance of computing. And over a very long period, it's been this continuous exponential curve. And just as I've said, it predicts that in 2029 that machines will have the intellect of an individual human and in 2045 of the entire human race. <clears throat> okay, so who am I? I'm Kim Solas. I uh, established the Banff classification and that uh, began in this building here, the Trans-Canada Pipeline Pavilion in, in the Banff Center. Um, so 24 years ago, Lorraine Rackison and I presided over a very small meeting that established the Banff classification. <clears throat> and for most of the subsequent time, between then and now, the benign guiding hand, whatever you want to say, of Dr. Rackison and myself has been the only structure that the Banff meetings have had. But that changed in 2013. Now, you probably expected we'd talk about pathology today, and so I'll give you a little bit of that. So the basic idea behind the BAMP classification is there are these characteristic lesions in the kidney that define rejection of various types. 
They are, for instance, uh, glomerulitis, which you see up there, and peritubular capillaritis and arteritis and tubulitis. And there are various uh, rules and formulas that define whether the criteria are met for various degrees of severity of cell-mediated and antibody-mediated rejection. And you may have thought, just like people in physics, you remember there was a time right about when quantum physics was beginning where it was announced in physics that everything was known, all knowledge had been attained. And maybe you kind of feel like that about transplant pathology now that, okay, we're done. But I assure you, we, we're, we're not done. We're in phase one and we can predict at least three phases of the future. Uh, so what we began in the kidney, copying to some extent what had been done in the heart, was then extended to the liver, pancreas, composite tissue graft. Uh, and the meetings now include all solid organs. And uh, we use semi-quantitative lesions scoring, diagnostic categories, um, the next meeting in Vancouver is going to be quite a bit different because what I'm talking to you about today is actually having some uh, influence on the program. So you might be interested. That's in October 2015. These are some of the milestones of the BAMP classification. Uh, and what we're very proud of is it includes everyone. And in this way, it's different from what the heart people began. We thought we were copying them. They published the international ISHLT classification for heart and lung in um, 1990. And so when I began these meetings in 91, I thought I was just sort of doing the, the, the kidney part of what they had done in the heart. But their effort was and has been <laughs> Uh, very much of a political nightmare because there are pathologists only on the papers. There are no clinicians, surgeons, basic scientists, no other stakeholders, whereas we have from the beginning included everyone, even weird entities like the Immune Tolerance Network and Pharma and, you know, everybody you can think of has had in input into this process. <clears throat> And uh, it, it's had quite an impact on the literature for those of you who read the a AJT. So the top cited AJT paper is a paper about Banff and the three top papers out of four are all papers uh, related to the Banff meetings. And these are uh, literature citations to Banff and these are parts in the world of the world where there are publications related to BAMF. Now you may have thought today, I was going to talk a lot about genomics, but I believe people have talked to you a lot about genomics. Everyone in this room had at least had five lectures or more about genomics and the future of uh, uh, renal diagnostics. So the genomic side of this, you might think of as phase two, and, and we are very much in that. Um, Phil is, is giving a, a talk at the next uh, Banff meeting. He was not able to go to the meeting in 2013, but he will be there in 2015. And this will be a part of the future of the Banff classification and of transplant pathology and of transplant practice. It's not sufficient for the financial viability of the BAMP Foundation that we've set, set up. In other words, we can't write a grant based on <laughs> genomics and have it seem innovative and sexy enough to provide funding for the BAMP Foundation's future. So what we had thought is if genomics and is the end of things, then we're going to have to merge with some other society and, and you know, we can't re remain an uh, independent entity. But I think that's not really the case at all. 
Just if you're interested in what these other pictures are, you probably all already know. That's uh, fluorescent staining for C4D down at the bottom left. This is hyaline arterial R change in calcineurin inhibitor toxicity, and these are uh, double contours in chronic transplant glomerulopathy with chronic uh, antibody damage. So as I say, we had the benign guiding hand of Drs. Rackison and myself uh, for many, many years. And then in 2013, we created a real st structure, a, a nonprofit Swiss foundation legal ent entity was created in 2013 that will enable us to do a number of things to enter into formal relationship with other organizations that we were not able to do before. And th this is the structure. <coughs> You'll notice Michael Mengel's name is here a lot. And uh, the rules are that the chair of the foundation can serve for two three-year terms, which means that I will no longer be the chair in 2019. And we presume that Michael will <coughs> take over leading this uh, organization at that time. <coughs> Some pictures of Banff over the years, and this is our next meeting, October 5th to the 10th, 2015. It'll be at the Sheraton Walls Center. Already had site visits there. It looks like it'll be a really excellent meeting. Um, and the target audience uh, certainly includes you guys, uh, but it, it's a very broad target uh, audience, including basic scientists, pathologists, and, you know, geneticists, so on and so forth, allied healthcare. <clears throat> How does the BAMP process work? It's um, rather interesting consensus generation. If you were to try to generate consensus about anything and solicit ideas about how to do that, you would uniformly be told you need a professional facilitator, somebody to come in and teach you a new way of thinking and put post-it uh, pieces of paper on, uh, on a large board and people spend a few hours visioning and that's the way uh, consensus is uh, established. So the person leading the discussion knows nothing about the subject, but knows everything about generating consensus. The entire time we've been doing this, we have never done that. We have never used a professional uh, facilitator. So we've always had physician uh, facilitators. So it's, it's different from that point of view. And it has mean, meant that the uh, physician facilitators had to give up his ideas when it was clear from the will of the people in the room that things were going in a different direction. So being macho and really steeped with testosterone and entering into the room with your conviction that you know everything about this, and that would never work. You have to be flexible and, and able to, to accept the will of the majority in the room, and it actually works better if we don't have to vote. We haven't voted now for many years. We used to vote in the beginning, but we don't vote anymore. So it's kind of different from most consensus generation, and it's often said to be the best meeting in transplantation. Well, that's ridiculous. It obviously can't be that. So why do people say that? It doesn't have the resources, doesn't have the scope. In every way you might define what the best meeting in transplantation is, this obviously isn't it. So why do people say that? Well, they enjoy being there. They, they get something out of it that they don't get out of other meetings. And why is that? And that has to do with Dunbar's number. Now, how many of you already know what Dunbar's number is? Ha! Huh, okay. Well, <laughs> this is kind of like a ver Oh, you, you know well, a little you bit? You mentioned it in another... <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, okay, yeah. So you've heard heard from me, yeah. What people mean is they like the size, atmosphere, and spirit and productivity of the meetings, and these are attributes that have to be maintained. What is Dunbar's number? So 
If you look at primate species, all of them, they, they have characteristic size of their social groups. And it relates entirely to the size of the prefrontal cortex. And you can relate it directly, as you see there. And for human beings, it comes out to be about 150. So when you go to a meeting that has about 150 people there, you actually care about the other people. When you see them in the hallway, you kind of like have uh, you know, empathetic friendship toward these people. You go to a larger meeting, most of the people you see in the hallway, even if you recognize them, you don't want to talk to them. You don't want to hear any you know, cool stories about their lives. You really don't. You want to keep on walking. And, and you have more and more experiences of seeing people that you recognize you really don't want to talk to. So this is a, a kind of comfortable meeting for that reason. And most of the working parts of the me meeting are within this Dunbar's number size. And uh, so we, we, we have tried to sort of merge my two interests of, of, of the future. And the, the other thing that's happening, other than machines becoming uh, smarter than human beings, is drugs are becoming much more costly to bring to market. And so that, that is another important factor here. So that's almost you know, exponential in the other direction. So they, people call that Eram's law as opposed to Moore's law. And so how does this come t together now, the, this general interest that I have in the technological sing singularity and uh, kidney medicine? Well, it, it comes together with the um, stem cell generated organ, stem cell generated heart, stem cell generated uh, kidney. And for those of you who are really in, den in denial about this, the November issue of AJT would have bothered you a lot because you realize if this is on the cover, this must be a real reality, at, at least in the heart. It's not just a theoretical thing because otherwise you couldn't put it on the front cover of the journal. It, it, it must be that there are like hundreds of clinical trials as there are. And you know, they, there's real activity in every way you can think about it. There are patients who can tell you that you know, their well-being has gone way up because they've had stem cell therapies and, and so on. So uh, it must be at least in the heart world that this is real. So it's not just a fantasy. When you talk to the average nephrologist, even very bright ones, this word fantasy comes up very often. So you, you try it yourself. You try relating to somebody. What I talked to you about this, this noon, to somebody else in renal medicine, and I bet there's a 50% chance that the word fantasy will come up. But then you know, tell them about the starting video. It's probably not. So what am I trying to do? I'm trying to jumpstart pe people to think about this in kidney medicine as something real. And to jumpstart a new area of pathology, which is looking at the abnormalities in stem cell created organs, because there are a lot of them. You say, well, you know, how, how interesting could that be? Think of kidneys without loops of Henley. These are very easy kidneys to make. As a matter of fact, you're more likely to make that kind of kidney than a normal kidney if you decellularize a kidney and then put cells back in. Somehow you get short circuits so that there's a complete tubular system, but it just doesn't go down to the medulla at all. <laughs> there are no long loops of Henley. So such a kidney would not be able to concentrate the urine at all. You could put that kidney in a patient and they'd pee out their entire body water in two hours and be dead, right? So that, that, that's not a useful kidney to have. And there, there are many other very intriguing problems, but the cool thing about this, if you think about old-fashioned renal physiology, back when renal medicine, the thing it was proud of most was renal physiology and the things you learned then, about the you know, Bricker's intact nephron uh, 
hypothesis and all, all that sort of stuff, it becomes relevant again when you're talking about how these stem cell generated organs work. What category of human being in the world knows the most, most about it? It's you guys. So this category of human being that's saying, this isn't us, it has nothing to do with us, it may completely replace us in the future, but it has nothing to do with our professional lives. You uniquely hold the answer to many of the important questions that, that exist in this area. And renal pathologists and you know pathologists for the other transplanted solid organs are going to be at the forefront of determining whether a given stem cell generated organ is going to work properly or not. Be, because you can frequently tell that from the morphology of the organ. <clears throat> so I don't know if the word scaffold has met, meant much in your life before, but I assure you in the future that it will. And a lot of the most boring things that you've seen in pathology slides suddenly become very, very interesting. Take a biopsy that you've done or been involved in that has an area of dense scar. Ordinarily, you would think that dense scar is the least interesting area of the biopsy. Well, let's just think about this. Okay, so you put detergent into a kidney to wash out the cells. So just think about that for a minute. Do you think you can wash out every cell? Probably not. Probably the cells in the midst of that dense scar are very hard to reach, right? So those cells remain. You, de quotes, decellarize the organ, but if you look at most of, of the articles, they don't just flush detergent. They then flush some room temperature perfusion solution without oxygen, without nutrients for a week, for seven days, and then they use the organ. Well, by that time, in the center of dense scars, the cells that were stuck there because you couldn't wash them out will be dead. So they won't have nuclei, you won't really see them. But that explains something else that, that's sort of fascinating about this, which is that the decellularizing process gets rid of 95% of the DNA, but the rest of it remains. You can't get rid of all of the original <laughs> DNA, so that's going to have consequences. You think you're just giving this collagen matrix that there would be no reaction to, but there's actually, from these dead cells in the middle of scars that previously have been like the most boring thing you'd probably think about, that is going to be antigenic, and, and it will mean that th this, this scaffold, when you recellularize it, still has some memory of where it came from. You can't really entirely get rid of that, not, not in a human kidney anyway. So you, you get rid of the cells, you then give bioactive factors, you, you repopulate it with new cells. How do you do that? Well, you heard, it, heard in the video you can't just give it into the artery. That doesn't reach enough parts of the kidney or parts of the organ. So you also have to give it up the ureter with considerable pressure. A little bit too much pressure and the kidney just, <laughs> just explodes, but you, you, you can get a lower pressure than that and you're kind of jamming these cells into the kidney. How, how do they know exactly where to go? Well, they don't all end up in the right place. So it's quite intriguing to figure out well, if you have podocytes that aren't in the glomerulus, they're out in you know, the interstitium, what's the consequence of that? If, if the cell populations are all mixed up, and you guys would intuitively realize that that matters more in the kidney than it does in the liver, the pancreas, so on, those organs have a more random structure and not quite the same sort of linear sort of dependence, for instance, of one area of the two tubule on some other area. So in the liver, if things were a little bit random, the liver would probably f figure it out. The kidney is going to be less good at figuring out these circumstances where you have all the right cells, but they're not in all the right places. And you know, it, 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 it begins to sound like the lyrics of a song, but it, it is going to be 
important for the patient who receives these organs. And, and, and the whole question of what happens over time, where do the blood vessels matter, where do you really not want big time blood vessels coming, like if you can think of you know, the inner medulla, you wouldn't want big sized vessels going down there because it would, it would get rid of entirely the countercurrent uh, gradient. And every organ's the same. It has areas where are natu they're naturally not well vascularized with large vessels and they're not supposed to be. So there, there are a whole host of things and just to summarize what I mean by a whole host of things, there are more things that can go wrong with a stem cell generated organ than there are known diseases in the native kidney, I think. Now some of them are maybe just one-off things that, that would only occur once and so you couldn't put it in any classification, but some will be repeated over and over, like this kidney that lacks long loops of Henley, I, th I think that, that will be a very common thing. <clears throat> so um, there are very few other people that, that you, whose name you would recognize working in this field. Um, Sammy uh, Iskander is a well-known renal pathologist and he's on this um, article from 2013 about um, decellularize human uh, kidneys. And that's where I really <laughs> came to grips with this idea. Like if you were to take out a kidney from any animal and just sort of leave it uh, for a week, it's going to look pretty sad and it's not going to have any nuclei. That's not because you flushed out all, all the cells, it's just everything would be dead. So that's in, in essence what they're doing. They're not providing any nutrients, any oxygen over this one week period. So um, I would say that the you know, pathologist author didn't have much influence over the paper way the paper was written because your um, initial impression w would be there are no nuclei because you've flushed out all the cells. But almost certainly that isn't true. There, 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 there is a more complex uh, dynamic what about your status as a Canadian? Okay, well there's also literature on regenerative medicine views amongst Canadians and Canada as a country is more accepting of uh, regenerative medicine than many other countries. So I, that video I showed you at the beginning, that is from an article by Song et al. from uh, Harold Ott's group, Harold is H-A-R-A-L-D. And what I was talking about is uh, podocytes going wandering in the interstitium. So this is stain for podocin. You see a lot of podocin's positive cells in those rats that are present in, in the interstitium. And there, there are many other things, some of which are simple, some are complex, but some of, the, some of the glomeruli don't get any cells at all. So you, you look in there and you see that the scaffold's there, but for some reason that particular you know, glomerulus has been missed when the cells went in. So some are missing cells entirely, some have only one cell population. And then what about the endothelium? That's kind of important. In many organs, you cannot repavement more than 80% of the endothelium. And the, the blood vessels that lack endothelium clot like mad. And so you need a sort of uh, constant, you know, anticoagulant infusion or, you know, uh, sort of artificial uh, uh, heparinized uh, surface or something like that. If you create an anticoagulant surface of all the uh, blood vessels, then their permeability changes, so the usual fluid flow doesn't, doesn't occur. It, it's nowhere near as simple as you might have thought. 
Now, some of you have heard me talk about this before and talk about David Crippen. I'm actually, this is the only slide about <laughs> David Crippen this time because I thought you might be getting tired of that. But um, as the field changes and stem cell grown organs replace transplantation, the or or organization we've created, the BAMF Foundation for Allograft Pathology needs to change also. Um, you know, the, the, it's kind of amusing in both, well, you may not find it amusing, but in both transplantation and renal medicine, there's a lot of literature about luster being lost and fewer or the best and brightest young people going into these fields and so on. I think that this, again, we, we don't need to be passive victims of this if we have a more forward-looking approach to what renal medicine is, then it'll be much in easier to uh, interest young people in entering it. You may know that in pediatric renal medicine, there was an article written about the recruitment problems, and um, they couldn't even get it reviewed. They were told by the official journals in their field, this is not a problem. Therefore, we will not review the paper. It's not there's something wrong with the paper. You've written a paper about an irrelevant subject. And that's where <coughs> that stands. So um, how quickly is this moving? There were YouTube videos now removed, because I don't think it would be quite as quick as this, saying stem cell generation complex organs in humans will be routine. Um, five years from now. I don't really think that's likely to be the case, but it at least will impact your life very soon, and you'd rather be proactive about it by being one of the few people in renal medicine who, who accepts this is a part of renal medicine. This is not something happening to us. It's not something strange and weird from the outside that, that, that will shut us down at some point, but you know, we're gonna keep going as long as we can. That, that's a sort of foolish way to think about this. Um, so, um, I strongly discourage you from thinking that this talk that I've given today has nothing to do with you personally. I think that would be not in your interest <laughs> to think that. I, if, if you feel that way, that's fine. But what I'm saying is, you know, the, the article that I wrote, you may have seen in, in, in the, the Edmonton Journal about being street smart for the future. A renal physician who's street, who is becoming street smart for the future will be interested in this and, and will sort of, you know, embrace learning about it. <clears throat> so, um, really, that, that's, that's what I wanted to tell you today. I, I think I've, I've said my piece, and I don't think I've run over time. We have a good, generous amount of time for discussion. What it means in uh, pathology is there's really a brand new specialty, and how do I know it's brand new? <laughs> kind of cool. As many of you know, my mentor. Robert uh, Heptonstall, and his textbook is the most successful textbook in renal pathology. And the new edition has just come out. It's completely electronic and searchable, and that means you can tell exactly what's in it. And if you search regenerative medicine, you won't get a single hit. And if you search tissue engineering, you won't get a single hit. So. There, it's not a single, it's completely silent about those areas. And yet I bet there's an eight to nine year gap between each you know, edition of that book. And by eight or nine years from now, that's gonna be a very active area of uh, renal path. So it's kind of exciting that it's completely missing from the book right now today. <clears throat> And you already have the knowledge. You needed it to get into renal medicine in the first place. So you probably thought these things were old fashioned and boring. But a lot of the most old fashioned, boring basics of renal physiology that you were forced to learn at some time, 
become really exciting now when you think of these recellularized kidneys with cells missing, cells in the wrong place, you know, with aberrant structure. How are they going to func function? How perfect do they need to be before they're put into patients? Now in the heart, you have, you know, ventricular assist devices. It's not uncommon to put in a heart and a, you know, ventricular assist device and then wait for the natural s stem cells in the patient to complete the re-population, um, um, re-cellularizing of the organ. So you might similarly in the kidney have patients who are being, you know, dialyzed now. You put in a stem cell generated kidney that's sort of almost there but doesn't quite have everything and you continue to then support the renal function of that patient while the rest of the cells from their natural stem cells sort of kick in. So it, it is possible that that's how it will work. So this is the last slide. Uh, this is that building where we created the BAMF classification before. If you think about that, many of you know Bob Colvin. Uh, is a kidney pathologist at um, Mass General. In 91, when we started the Banff classification, he had already been in kidney transplant pathology and was a leader in that area for five or six years. So we were not the first, certainly. He, he was the first. Uh, whereas here, I, I think honestly with this tissue engineering uh, pathology, as far as I can See, we, we are the first, so I'm kind of happy about that, that at least when, 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 when I do something this uh, second time, we're, we're not late at the party. Okay, so let's turn on the lights and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Yes? Have the, do these regenerated kidneys have the capacity to secrete substances like erythropoietin, vitamin D? Yes, I, I think, uh, but that, that's a very good question. So in Harold Ott's lab, would they even think of that question? I mean, it's kind of, kind of amazing. What I would challenge you is find the renal medicine errors in his papers. There are very few. There are no renal physician authors at all. So go through the paper seriously and look for the flaws that you believe should be there because of the unique knowledge you have that those authors lack. And what's scary to me is I can find very few things that they've missed. So, I, I mean, obviously there's the journal review process and that, that, that's part of what you're seeing. But I think, you know, you know that's a kind of you know, challenge to you that, that, that um, I bet maybe before they sent in the paper, they might not have thought about that. They, they might not have thought of, you know, the endocrine role of, you know, the kidney. But I bet now that they're quite, you know, familiar with that. And you don't want to end up in the area of, of uh, the situation where the amateur nephrologists of the world are doing more interesting stuff than you guys are. You're the real nephrologist. The most interesting stuff should be going, should be going on in, in, in your area, not people who are just sort of playing in your area. But right now, there are some startling examples where papers without any renal physician authors have very exciting stuff and very few flaws that I can see. Yeah, but it, it's the same as what I was saying. When you say a kidney function, if you imagine a kidney lacking loops of Henle, so its urine production rate would be very high, right? So if, if you're thinking of so function. I, I don't know if you remember, in, in 1966, they used, they used to be the green journal. Yes, yeah. There was an editorial in called Human Communal Success. Mm -hmm. Right, yep. <coughs> right, uh, Klaus uh, Turow. Yeah. Prevent the sudden loss of all salt and water. 
yeah. situation. Yeah. So, so yeah. It's, it's, it's really this, unless the issue of the tubular regeneration is resolved, it might, might not happen. Kidney is complex as opposed to heart and liver, etc. Yeah. It won't become like that organ. You need to because those something you have to prevent from loss of salt and water. Which is a fundamental... Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But the the thing is... No, I know that in, they were doing stem cell renewing bladders, which are much more simpler. Actually, I haven't heard much about how successful is that routine now? Or people have talked about, because which will be a simpler thing, because it's few cells... Yeah. Organ, well, this. all tubular organs, the... Yeah, you know, vagina is the, the, the big organ in, in the last year, so, so they've done, you know, esophagus, uh, you know, so, so trachea. The, anything that's basically a, a tube is fairly easy to successfully make with uh, stem cells. How routine it is, I can't give you the numbers, but I think it, it, it is quite, you know, successful. The guy who has the best known uh, liver article um, was talking about how short a time those livers actually worked. It was a few hours. I mean, it, it was the first time, you know, and so on, <laughs> because they clotted like mad. So, so you know, it, it was really not practical from that point of view. They had tremendous uh, epithelial cell necrosis, but in the liver, it really doesn't matter. You can clean up that stuff, and you know, as long as some cells are living, the others will, you know, regenerate and so on. The kidney is nowhere near as uh, forgiving, but I think you'd all be very badly mistaken if you just say, okay, so it's not going to happen in the kidney. It is going to happen, and it's the most exciting thing. It's you know, the moon shot. Lay people articles about this are talking about the stem cell generated kidney as the moonshot. When I went to a regenerative medicine meeting last May, there were no renal physicians there, absolutely none, but the kidney was the organ most discussed. So just think about that. That, that is something wrong with this picture. So, um, you know, if, if you're in a field that is going to be the moonshot in regenerative medicine, do you want to practice in that field as if the whole thing's a fantasy and to be completely blindsided someday? I don't think that's good for you. So that, yeah. So I had a question. You focus very much on borrowing a cytoskeleton uh, and uh, putting stem cells in there. Right. Uh, if we were just to kind of get a whiteboard out and start trying to do this ourselves as we are students at, at school. Uh, right. We might, and a part of me wonders, we think, well, the kidney is complex. The, we, all, we all have varying degrees of knowledge of the embryogenesis of the kidney, which is relatively complicated, dependent right. on the pressures within the uh, developing bladder and uh, urinary system, etc. Et right. Yeah. So, is it out of favour the idea that we should be growing a kidney from scratch in a more physiological way? as opposed to finding a cytoskeleton and hoping all the cells will organize themselves in a, in a kind of... I think system. everything's worth pursuing. And, 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 and uh, I think what's not worthwhile is hiding our heads in the sand. But no, I, no, I think everything is worth, worth pursuing. The, the thing, you, you, get a, you get certain fads, like the, the fad is, it's now very sexy in the world of science to take a pink organ and turn it white and then turn it pink again. People think that's just the most amazing thing. Even if the cells that are turning it the pink the second time are all the wrong cells, like that's easy to do. If you take cultured proximal tubular cells, you can turn a you know, kidney pink, but it doesn't have any of the cells that it needs to actually function. But it's but it's pink, so it it, it can, and it it becomes kind of uh, you know it 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 has to do with uh, show business, celebrity, all this sort of thing. The surgeons uh, at this regenerative medicine 
meeting, don't look entirely happy because they're, they're, they're sort of having to falsify things. You, you know that in uh, California, there's CIRM, this California Institute of Regenerative Medicine, with huge amounts of resources, but that have to be voted on frequently by the general public. So you have to have good results or this revenue stream will, so they, they can't talk about anything bad because they're afraid that the public will hear, hear about it and stop voting for the funding. And, and, and so, for instance, you see the most beautiful pictures of the stem cell generated kidneys. They always show them human size, but they're actually rat or mouse kidneys. So if you look carefully, you, you realize they've just taken a rat or mouse kidney and blown it up to human size, but all you know, they, they, they realize it doesn't work to suggest this is a rat or a mouse because, you know, the public said, well, how is that going to help me, you know? I want a big kidney my size. So, um, yeah. And, and, and if, if you look at the YouTube videos that sound as if they're about stem cell generated kidneys, they're really about stem cell generated bladders. And so they have, if you will, kidney patients, but it's a lower urinary tract problem that this kidney patient has that they you know, interview about this miraculous cure. But when you think, what were the pressures that caused them to create a uh, video like that where the uninformed member of the public would think that they're actually making kidneys right now. That, that's that's cer certainly what it superficially suggests. And I think the, so it's a strange area to be in for the people who are mainly in it now. We need more normal people like those of you in this room to sort of bring it back to, uh, you know, mainstream, so. Yeah. So yeah. obviously, um, I mentioned before, they're doing trials and fireside beta cell or stem cell derived beta cells right. that start here in the next mm -hmm. year or two for right. people with type one diabetes. Yeah. Um, and for a long time, the stem stem cells uh, stem cell derived beta cells have been on the horizon in type one diabetes. Um, but the major barrier that they have now sidestepped is the one of tumors. Mm -hmm. And the way they've cited it is they've decided, they've decided well, we'll stop thinking about infusing these cells on their own. They have to be encapsulated. So all of the current stem cell uh, 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 kind of stem cell projects that are close to first in man trials or about right. to start first in man trials are all encapsulated in like tea bags or a variety right. of other things or oxygen yep. delivery devices. So these organs you were talking about, that, that isn't an option, is it? Because, uh, no, and so that explains they, something else. So when you watch YouTube videos about stem cell generated organs, most of the presenters talk about how self-regulating this is. That stem cells magically know how to, you know, grow an organ to a certain size and then stop. And, and to repair wounds where, where they go in and fill in the defect and, and, you know, bring the wound back to normal and then they stop. But you know that they're not going to stop 100% of the time, but it's better for the general public not to get the idea that tumors generated by these stem cells are going to be a very common thing. We just don't know. what There's certainly the, the possibility of that. Um, but the challenge, it's, it's just like I said, it's what guarantees that in 2045 you'll all be employed. So think about it that way. It's, it's to your advantage, you know? <laughs> your whole extended family would benefit from your focusing on this just a little bit, so you'll know enough in 2045, be one of those unique people who the, the, the human race still needs you guys to, to be in a paying job because, you know, the rest of, it, the rest of us depend upon this unique knowledge that you have. So. <clears throat> okay, any other questions? Right. Well, thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Yeah.